The nation of Ireland is a contradiction. On one hand, it is a land of beauty. Green rolling hills, majestic valleys, and jagged cliffs mark the countryside. On the other hand, Ireland's history bears the deep scars of poverty, oppression, and hunger. This lecture series will discuss the Great Irish Potato Famine of the 1840s, the worst famine ever to strike this proud and ancient land. But first, it's important to understand what Ireland was like before the potato failed in 1845. By the beginning of the 19th century, Ireland had become a huge source of anxiety for England. The English had ruled Ireland since 1169, when it was first invaded. But since 1169, Ireland had never fully been assimilated or even subdued. In fact, England had to conquer Ireland over and over and over. One such conquest, led by Oliver Cromwell, was so brutal that it left only 500,000 Irish people alive in the entire nation of Ireland. Some historians refer to this and other conquests as acts of genocide. During these invasions and the ensuing bloodshed, Irish land was forcibly confiscated and redistributed to English landlords. By 1800, after centuries of British oppression, the Irish were still a very separate people, desperately poor and hostile to their British masters. On January 1st, 1801, the British Parliament enacted a law that would supposedly bring these two nations together. This law was called the Act of Union, and many in England thought of it as a marriage. The two economies of England and Ireland would become one. The Irish Parliament in Dublin would completely disappear, and the Irish would now be ruled by the British Parliament in Westminster. On the outside, it seemed like this Act of Union would actually benefit Ireland quite a bit. For example, it would encourage free trade between the two nations, allowing goods to flow freely between Ireland and England. The new law theoretically encouraged British investment into Ireland to help modernize Ireland's outdated economy and infrastructure. At the turn of the 19th century, Ireland still hadn't caught even a whiff of the Industrial Revolution, though England's powerhouse economy had already been transformed by it. In addition, Ireland would gain more of a voice in government, as Irish politicians would be admitted into the British Parliament to help rule the empire, and Catholics, who made up three-fourths of Ireland's population, might finally be granted equal status after centuries of second-class citizenship and oppression at the hands of the Protestant British. However, some in Parliament understood the Act of Union for what it really was, a tool to subdue Ireland and teach her obedience. Two years earlier, in 1798, the Irish had rebelled yet again. This time, England's arch-nemesis, France, had aided them in their cause, supplying troops and money to Ireland, eager to foment insurrection at England's back door. For the French, this was a sweet piece of revenge. After all, during the French Revolution the previous decade, England had eagerly encouraged civil war within France. This 1798 revolt, also inspired by the ideals of the American Revolution, was put down with savagery by the British. English troops lynched Irish civilians, flogged them in public, and forced the people of Ireland to endure yet another humiliating defeat. The 1801 Act of Union was a law designed to keep this from happening again, and many millions of independence-minded Irishmen opposed it. In his History of Great Britain, Charles Coote referred to the Union not as a marriage, but as a brutal rape. Ireland was described as an heiress who was dragged screaming to the altar. Irish landowners had to be bribed with lordships and peerages to secure their support of the bill, while Irish Catholics were falsely promised emancipation if they agreed to the Union. So how did the Act of Union actually affect Ireland? First of all, the economic miracles promised by the bill's supporters never materialized. Capital did not magically begin flowing into Ireland. In fact, the flow of money out of Ireland only became more pronounced as the years went forward. Pre-industrial Ireland remained a market for England's cheap surplus goods as England continued to modernize its booming economy. Ireland's fledgling industries could never hope to compete with those of the mother country, so the already weak Irish economy shuffled toward collapse. Widespread unemployment and hunger followed, except in the Protestant Northeast, which enjoyed industrial expansion and prosperity. Dublin an important world capital before the Act of Union, witnessed the destruction of its political power when the Parliament was dissolved. 
Ireland's declining capital was referred to by some as a half-dead city. Upon realizing that the signers of the Act of Union had surrendered Ireland's autonomy in exchange for no significant gains, many Irish citizens sunk into a state of helpless hostility. Perhaps the most disappointing outcome of the Act of Union was the continued oppression of Catholics in Ireland. Having been promised tolerance, reforms, and freedom of religion by the British government, the Irish citizens were alarmed to discover that all such tolerant language had been stripped from the final bill. Catholics were just as unequal as ever, denied many of the basic human freedoms guaranteed by the English Constitution, including the right to run for public office. The only difference was that now they were ruled by a faraway British Parliament rather than the now abolished Irish Parliament that had stood as a symbol of self-governance for 500 years. It should be no surprise then that the Act of Union did little to subdue the poverty-stricken, furious, revolution-minded, very Catholic Irish. Religious turmoil was nothing new to the Irish people. A seemingly unbridgeable gulf between Ireland and England had developed 300 years earlier during the Reformation, which had split the Catholic Church and created the Protestant movement. While this pivotal event reshaped religion in England, creating generations of eager British Protestants suspicious of traditional Catholicism and its followers, the Reformation left Ireland virtually unchanged. In the grand religious struggles of the next 300 years, Protestant England and Catholic Ireland consistently found themselves supporting opposite sides in almost every battle. Catholicism, which to the Irish was an integral part of their culture and national identity, could only flourish with English defeat. So time and time again, Ireland sided with England's enemies. It's almost as if the two nations had opposite histories. One needs only to examine how the people perceived their own historical figures and events to see the difference. For example, Queen Elizabeth, a powerful ruler who helped usher in an era of British Protestantism, represented in England everything that was great about English monarchy and English leadership. She was an enlightened child of the Renaissance, a brilliant politician, a tolerant and capable administrator, a cunning tactician in affairs of state, a military strategist, and a powerful symbol of feminism in a male-dominated society who, through her own intelligence and grit, put England on the path to future greatness. In Ireland, however, Elizabeth was not a symbol of greatness, but of horror and subjugation. During her reign, the British military invaded Ireland to regain control over the rebellious Irish lords and used scorched earth techniques to punish the disobedient Irish. They destroyed wells of drinking water, salted the soil, and committed atrocities against civilians. More than 30,000 starved to death during the conflict, and in the end, the British monarchy was again declared sovereign over all of Ireland. The defeat of the Spanish Armada which in England represented a glorious military victory against a dangerous rival, symbolized to the Irish the death of their dreams for independence. The Spanish forces, who had promised aid and arms to Ireland in their time of need, instead sank ignominiously to the bottom of the sea, taking with them Ireland's last hope for achieving freedom. After Elizabeth's invasion, the Irish were rewarded for their insubordination with a series of laws designed to destroy Catholicism and turn the Irish into second-class citizens in their own country. The penal laws, as they were called, reduced Irish Catholics to helpless impotence. One contemporary predicted that the Irish would become, quote, insignificant slaves. Among other things, these laws barred Catholics from public office, resulting in an entirely Anglican ruling class governing a nation of powerless serfs. Catholics could no longer serve in the military, own property, vote, participate in commerce, publish books, teach, attend school, or worship freely. These handicaps helped guarantee that generations of peasants would be desperately poor, illiterate, and entirely dependent on British landlords for aid. Catholic priests could be executed for ministering the Catholic faith, and priest hunting became something of a sport for British soldiers in Ireland. The murder of a Catholic civilian was rarely, if ever, prosecuted. Irishmen who resisted these laws were imprisoned, 
executed, or even shipped to America as indentured servants, never to return. Even the Gaelic language was banned. According to British politician Edmund Burke, the penal laws were, quote, a machine of wise and elaborate contrivance, as well fitted for the oppression, impoverishment, and degradation of a people, and the debasement in them of human nature itself, as ever proceeded from the perverted ingenuity of man. In Ireland, these laws were greeted with the utmost contempt. Rage, lawlessness, and hunger for revenge swept across the nation. The once powerful aristocratic families of Catholic Ireland were ruined as their lands were confiscated and handed to absentee British landlords. The lower classes, already living in poverty, now faced a new brand of humiliating abasement, the constant fear of arrest simply for practicing their faith. To be a Catholic in Ireland, one now had to become an outlaw. It is not surprising, then, that many secret societies sprang up throughout Ireland as a result of these laws. Groups like the Oak Boys and the Ribbon Men dispensed the people's justice, otherwise known as revenge, to anyone who supported the English law or tried to enforce it. British loyalists were brutally beaten and sometimes murdered, their property stolen, their homes destroyed, their animals locked in a barn and burned alive. These cathartic acts of violence did nothing to improve relations between Irish Catholic subjects and British rulers. One member of the House of Commons, when debating what should be done about Ireland, said, quote, How do you govern it? Not by love, but by fear. Not by the confidence of the people in the laws, but by means of armed men and entrenched camps. So by the time the Act of Union was passed in 1801, centuries of religious persecution, economic domination, and military tyranny had taken their toll on the nation of Ireland. Irish poverty was appalling. French sociologist Gustave de Beaumont, who traveled through Ireland in the early 19th century, wrote that Irish peasants experienced, quote, the extreme of human misery, worse than the Negro in his chains. Half of the population lived in windowless mud huts. Families that owned pigs often kept the pigs inside their homes, so Irish hovels often featured trickling manure piles in the same room where everyone slept and ate. The Irish lacked basic amenities that even British peasants took for granted. For example, Donegal had a population of 9,000 people, but only 10 beds. Many Irish were too poor to afford even a mud hut. As they wandered the countryside in search of work or food, these itinerant peasants would either sleep in roadside ditches or dig holes in the ground and sleep there. <laughs>